Hey, Misty, how are you? I'm good. We had to mute ourselves because we're making dinner and the fire alarm keeps going off. Okay. <laughs> is it we're okay, everyone. Mike's making dinner. <laughs> is it stir fry or something? <laughs> we, you know you're not supposed to bring a char or a gas grill indoors. Just wanted to let you know about that. Yeah. Well, only just, you can do it once. <laughs> are you all cook are you all cooking enough for everybody on the call? Sure. A three pound turkey. It's about this big. <laughs> so, we haven't been home for dinner in months. So well, I had six o'clock. I don't know about you all. I don't want to be here till 10 o'clock. Uh, I say we get started and hopefully the uh, uh, other two contestants will be joining us. Um, but um, welcome to session five. I don't know about you all, but has five weeks flown by or what? Um, and tonight I'm looking forward to this session. Uh, this is all focused on where's the money. And we have three people that have a wealth of knowledge in the finance industry. Um, uh, so I first want to introduce our uh, panelists tonight and let them get started. And once they finish and all the questions are answered, guys, you all can leave. And then we have some housekeeping items to discuss about next week's pitch night and et cetera. So uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, first up, I'm just going to go by my Brady Bunch screen. I'm going to um, Jeremy Repass with People Incorporated Financial Services is joining us, and Jeremy will tell us more when he when he starts um, about what uh, People Incorporated has to offer. Uh, second on my screen is Ernie Maddie with the wonderful organization of Virginia Community Capital. They have some of the nicest people that work there, um, and he could tell more about what. Um, he does it at People Incorporated. He does, I'm not, excuse me, I've got you on my mind because you're on the top of my screen, um, Jeremy, but what he does at Virginia Community Capital, especially his focus on real estate lending, but uh, he's been around for quite some time. And then I'm hoping that we can see his uh, face at some point is um, uh, uh, Matt Tewer with First Sentinel Bank. Um, and Matt, I'm glad that you can join us and represent uh, Tazewell County uh, financing industry. So, um, Jeremy, I'm going to let you go first. If you can introduce yourself, tell about what uh, People Incorporated has to offer your programs, and then we'll get into allowing the uh, competitors to ask questions. And I hope they came with lots and lots of questions. So, Jeremy, it's all yours. All righty. Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, thank you all for getting together. Good luck to all of you. Um, so as she said, I'm Jeremy Repass. I'm the senior business lender with uh, People Incorporated. And People Incorporated, the, the two primary focuses that we do are the micro loans through the SBA, which is $50,000 and under. Um, that money can be used for, I, I like to say in, in somewhat of four walls, can be used for anything but um, uh commercial financing, real estate financing, that kind of thing. Uh, you could use it for working capital, purchasing equipment, um, inventory. Um, you can upgrade any uh, existing uh, property that you may be renting if you have to do your own build out um, or up, uh, upgrade your, your current property that you own. And we can secure the loans with property. We just can't make the actual purchase uh, with that SBA money. Um, Right now, that's at seven and a half percent. And as I mentioned earlier, we go up to 50,000 uh, with those SBA micro loans. We also administer several um, community block grants and so forth, like the Hayside Loan Fund, the Downtown Bristol Redevelopment Fund, um, those kind of things. And we also have um, the NDDF, which is an acronym for uh, Ninth District Development Financing. It's hard to say. Um, which is tourism-based uh, financing. That program was started up in 1995 by Congressman Rick Boucher to kind of help boast um, and build the tourism industry within the Congressional Ninth District of Virginia, which runs from about Roanoke uh, South or South uh, West, I should say, 
um, of all of Virginia, and that is at 3.5%, but it does again have to be tourism related. Um, so that's primarily uh, what we do. The, the NDDF terms, we can go uh, 15 year terms. Uh, we, we have done some 20 year balloons uh, with those to try to help get those payments down for clients uh, the best we can. Um, but uh, we can set it up on a 15 year term. Um, as far as what's needed to apply, we'll probably get into that a little bit more in the conversation. Or if you're interested in looking at some th one of the programs that we have, I'd be more than happy to speak with you or send you some information over um, and answer any questions that you may have. So, um, Sandy, I hope that suffices for a little bit of what we do. That works for me. So, Ernie, take it away. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Ernie Matty. I'm a vice president in our commercial real estate lending department um, here at VCC. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have uh, two different kind of lending divisions um, uh, within Virginia Community Capital. I handle the commercial real estate, uh, which involves um, multifamily live uh, uh, apartments or condos. Uh, one to four, <clears throat> excuse me, one to four family investment properties, uh, commercial, retail, uh, mixed use. We do a lot of historic tax credit rehab projects. Uh, kind of what commercial real estate is, if it's going to be a non-owner occupied building, it's going to be a building that generates income from leases and things like that. And then we have a small division, I mean, a small business division. I believe you met Cindy Snyder earlier. Uh, she taught one of the classes there. She handles all of her small business lending, which involves um, three or four different types of SBA loans. Um, <clears throat> and that'll involve real estate as well if it's owner occupied. So if <clears throat> you're gonna have a business in the building that you're purchasing or one that you already own, that would be a small business real estate deal instead of a commercial real estate deal. Um, one of the specialties for our small business lending team because of the SBA loans is business acquisitions. If you're selling your business or you're, you're looking to buy a business, uh, Cindy has a program that can get you into uh, owning that new business uh, with less money down than, the, than a normal conventional loan would. Um, they, she has loans for working capital. She has loans for uh, equipment acquisition. Um, obviously refinance on the real estate to purchase real estate. Um, we were a big player in the PPP loans um, and she's, she's here in Southwest Virginia as well and would handle all of those. So that's kind of how we're split up. Um, that, that gives you an idea what VCC does. I think what Sandy wants us here for tonight, me and Jeremy and Mike are giving you ideas of what you want to do when you go to the banks to, to get if you're going to ask for money or if you're going to people incorporated to ask for money. Um, <clears throat> just a couple tips. Definitely know exactly what you need. Don't go in saying you'll take whatever they'll give you. That's a scare, scares a banker to death if they hear that. Um, have a good breakdown of exactly what you're going to be using the money for. Um, explain how you plan to pl pay the money back uh, and then how you pay and plan to pay the money back if that first option doesn't work. So we're always looking for secondary sources of income to, to help with payments as well. Um, know your credit. Uh, don't go in and be surprised by something that's in your credit. So make sure you take a look at that before you go to the bank and be ready to address any issues that may arise because they're definitely going to look at it. Um, and then know your numbers. I think we'll go over financials a little more here later, but know your financials, know where they're coming from, know where you figured them from just so the bank knows the bank will get comfortable if you're obviously comfortable with the numbers and, and you're able to discuss how you came about getting those numbers. So I'll give Mike a chance and then I think we can, we'll take some questions or. Okay, uh, Matt, uh, are um, you, um, did you ever, I know he's having some audio problems. Were you able to get on with us? Can you hear me, Sandy? I sure can. Great, okay. you're, you're not a figment of our imagination. <laughs> I, I am here, and I, first off, I want to apologize. My camera basically crashed and shut down my whole system, so I think I can move forward audio, but unfortunately, you guys 
are not going to be able to see my beautiful face, and I hate that for you. But uh, just just as a quick introduction, uh, my name is Matt Taylor. I am the Chief Credit Officer at First Sentinel Bank. Uh, I am a certified public accountant. I've worked in banking approximately 15 years. I've also worked in public accounting and public accounting for five years. Uh, just, just kind of building on what Jeremy and Ernie kind of started with, uh, AirBank, we, we specialize in small business lending up to $2 million. We do fund, originate and fund everything in-house. So all our decisions are made in-house. Uh, we're more than happy to, to finance commercial real estate. We finance uh, commercial equipment. Uh, like Ernie said, we, we look at primary sources of repayment. Uh, we also review collateral. Uh, we, we do require collateral and we require personal guarantees on our small business loans. But quite frankly, if, if you provide a, a good business model and a good business plan to us and, and what you've got makes sense and, and the collateral and, and cash flow, we get comfortable with the numbers. We, we can pretty much finance any type of small business loan that you want to. And we've got various rates and terms and amortization schedules and things like that, which we could get into later. But that's just kind of a, a, a over the first central bank. We we offer small business lending with the full complement of deposit products because we want to build a relationship with you guys. It's our goal to see our customers grow, see their businesses grow, and become successful. So we really just want to be partners with you guys. And uh, hopefully tonight we can go through some, through some things that will help us to uh, kind of get that partnership initiated uh, and off on the right foot. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, I'm going to allow questions from our competitors. This is your opportunity to ask, where's that free money at? So speak up. I'm curious, uh, Jeremy, about you mentioned the NDDF, and and I'm curious of how you said that relates to tourism. Um, what was it that you said? How uh, the, I believe there was a grant you referred to. Yeah, the the NDDF. What it's for is basically it's it's only used for tourism. So pretty much. What they, and they've, they've kind of gotten diverse in what they consider. Um, before it was kind of hard to do like restaurants um, because it had to be something that drew tourism to um, the area, Southwest Virginia. But right. if, if pretty much, and, and kind of like the breweries, it, I, it was kind of an uphill climb for a little while, right. you know, to try to get the, the board on, um, uh, on, on board, no pun intended, with, um, trying to get the breweries included into that, but right. with having that brew trail that now that they have where the different breweries are kind of, you know, people go from brewery to brewery trying different brews, um, I was able to get that one included. So pretty much what we do is we sit down and we analyze the business and say, okay, is this something that would bring tourism to the area or is it in an area that um, has tourism related stuff there and this would just be an addition to or complement that kind of thing. Or, or like a support. Do you all do any um, like bed and breakfasts? I, I have a, an Airbnb and mm -hmm. because of COVID, I'm not, I'm not serving breakfast, but that was what I had envisioned to grow my business to. That's kind of on hold right now, though that's not part of the challenge. Does it have to be a part, a question related only to the <laughs> yeah, we we the, we can do. I mean, we can do bed and breakfast through that tourism program. Okay. Um, we've done a lot here lately. We've done a lot of cabins, as you may know, over in St. Paul. The Spearhead Trail is kind of it took off. Um, you know, before the the COVID thing hit, there it, it was a lot there, um, and we've done a lot of cabins and campgrounds and those kind of things um, for people to do as well. Okay. Okay. Thank hey, you. Jared. Hey, Jeremy, it's Blake Ray. How are you? Doing well, sir. Yourself? Doing well. So the, now is that a grant or is that a loan? Um, it's a loan. It's a loan at three and a half percent. Um, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a grant. Probably the grant that I was speaking of, or when I mentioned the word grant, what you'll have is community block grants, which is where 
um, a local entity may have a grant that was issued to them, say, from the state of Virginia um, to give out in the form of a loan because they want that to be a revolving type grant, kind of like a right. revolving right. fund. Um, and some of those local entities don't have the cap capabilities of the lending aspect of that. So they pay people incorporated administrative fees to administer those grants. Okay. Well, so I guess with, with that being related to tourism, it sounds like lodging is included, right? It is, so, yes. So if there was a boutique hotel situation, would that be something that you guys would service? And then furthermore, like what, what are the terms as far as how large you can go? Um, and then, you know, amortization schedules, that sort of thing. We, we can go for a term of up to 15 years. Um, we can look at doing like a 20 year balloon um, and, and probably doing like a, a 15 year am, or a, a amortizing it for 20 years and doing like a five year balloon um, is okay. what I was meaning to say. Um, it's at three and a half percent. Um, there is a, a 3% loan origination fee with that loan that can be included in the loan proceeds. Okay. And then, and then what about, uh, limits as far as, you know, how much you can borrow or how much the program funds, that sort of thing. T typically we like to stay at or below, or we like to stay below $250,000 per loan. Um, however, it is funds available. It's, it depends upon the availability of funds. Um, I know we just had, we were kind of dry there for a good six, seven months, but we just had a substantial loan to pay off. And as soon as that one closed out, um, before we get off this call, I can review and tell you how much would be available, but I want to say it's somewhere around, I'd say $150,000, $200,000 range that's available right now. So that is a loan, and do you want, I mean, is it one with collateral? I, I think Mr. Maddie may have mentioned their loans, they may require collateral. Do you all? We do, my, my, and, and I don't want to speak for Ernie or Matt, but most business loans that you're going to get right now are going to require okay. two things. They're going to require, most of them require a personal guarantee um, um, from either the business owner or business owners. And most all of your business loans are going to require some type of collateral um, where the loan amount is so big with the ninth district development, uh, real estate is highly looked upon. Um, mm -hmm. However, you know, people incorporated and that's, that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because people incorporated, what we try to do is step in either to partner with the banks or to step in. If somebody say you're a new business and don't quite meet the qualifications for banks or so forth, right. Right. we just kind of want to bridge that gap to get okay. you to a bankable status because uh, folks like Ernie and Matt are going in the long run, maybe not necessarily with the NDDF because it's tourism related, but for mm -hmm. most of the loans outside of tourism, you're probably going to get a better rate going through someone like Ernie or Matt. Um, but if your business is young, um, or may not have the revenue that's needed just yet, you know, then people incorporated can bridge that gap there for you. Okay. Matt, Thank Ernie, you. do you all want to add anything to? Yeah, <clears throat> he, he kind of hit it there with us. Uh, any, any owner of the business or the real estate that owns more than 20% of the uh, overall business is required to sign a personal guarantee. Uh, for the business loans, we will take uh, equipment we can do obviously real estate we can do some accounts receivables uh, and things like that we can use as collateral on the loans and then the SBA guarantee helps make up if there's a collateral shortfall as well but um, <clears throat> in today's times there's not you're not going to I don't think you'll be able to find a, a business loan with you know non-recourse or no uh, no collateral it's, they're just not out there anymore <clears throat> Yeah, I agree with exactly what Ernie and Jeremy is both saying, especially in a startup business. Uh, you're going to definitely have to provide that quote unquote skin in the game and show that you've got personal buy in and what you're trying to sell the bank. Uh, but in as far as collateral goes, definitely in a startup, uh, we're, we're, we want to look at collateral. That way we can kind of develop the uh, amortization schedule, the repayment uh, and just the overall plan of, of how how you're going to grow and be able to pay us back as well.
Hey, Ernie. Yes. Hey, it's Blake Ray again. So Virginia is Virginia Community Capital. So how do you guys differ from a traditional lender? Um, and what would be the benefit of going with a product or service that you offer uh, versus, you know, my traditional bank? Um, it's a good question. We're actually, uh, I don't know how much you know about VCC. Uh, we've been around now, like Sandy is right at 14 years or <laughs> going on 15. You're around that area. I'm yeah. right, I think I'm close, but um, we were started back by, back when we were started, it was four separate state agencies put up grants to start uh, kind of what would be a hometown bank for the state of Virginia. But the, where we're different from your normal bank is we're a for-profit bank, just like your bank is, but we're actually owned by a nonprofit. So the, the nonprofit, we have a board that makes our decisions. Um, so that's how we're able to stay smaller. We, we only have uh, three locations. Um, we, now, I like your bank, we'll still do your normal deposits. We'll do the, a loan that a, and your normal bank will do, we'll do. And then where we're a little different is uh, when we take our loans to the board for approval, we take it two ways. We take it with the financials and that impact, and then we take it with kind of on our mission side as well. And our mission is to provide funds to uh, communities that they're in an economic development time, or they just don't have the other sources of funds for that area for certain businesses. So our nonprofit is able to get grants from the U.S. Treasury, from SBA, and places like that, that we can blend with our normal bankrupt loans. So then we're able to offer what we call our below market rates. Uh, a lot of that we do now is in our low income housing market. Uh, we get a capital magnet money that allows us to offer, uh, if you're providing affordable housing, we can go lower rates. Uh, on the small business side, um, we've got some different funds that it, depending on what type of business it is, I know we've got some grants in the fresh foods area where if there's a food desert and you're looking to put um, a market or a deli or something that would bring bring a service to that community that's not there, we can do, use our, we use our normal loan funds from the bank, but we're either able to buy the rate down or we can guarantee some of that loan if if the uh, borrower doesn't have as much collateral or equity into the project, we can use that fresh food fund to do that. And we're always out looking for grants for certain areas that we can match with our normal loan funds. And the, the reason we're able to get those grants is because if we can take $100,000 and leverage it with a million dollars of our loan funds and put a million and $1.1 million of impact into a community instead of just a hundred thousand. So yeah. um, if it's a mission related deal, we're able to stretch a little bit. We can, we can go to 80 or 85% on certain deals. Um, it just all depends on, you know, what the, what the market is, where you're doing the business and then the type of business. Is it something that's really going to help revive that community? Or is it something that's desperately needed in the community that's not there now? Okay. And so where are, where are your rates derived from? Are they, you know, prime LIBOR rates like normal or, I mean, are those decisions made in house on, Hey, let's give them a 1% cut on prime or, you know, how, how do you guys come to that conclusion? And that's kind of how the small business side works. Cause the, the, you know, they have uh, different programs they work with and Cindy would be able to kind of nail down rates with you there on the business loans on the commercial real estate side. We, we base that, we do all of our loans on a five year fixed rate. And then we amortize them for 25 years. And we use the five year current market treasury plus whatever the spread is for the bank. And then again, if it fits into one of those categories where the nonprofit has a um, grant, we'll normally do 80% of our bank loans at our normal bank rate and then 20% of the funds from that grant. So we're normally able to lower the rate by, you know, one to one and a quarter, um, again, depending on how large the loan is. Okay. And on the, we, we go up to... Um, uh, the small business and commercial real estate will do up to 5.4 million right now. Okay. And so the commercial real estate is for non, non-investor occupied, correct? So non owner occupied, at, right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. What we see a lot is individuals will form a real estate holding company and just have an LLC to hold that real estate. And it may be the person that owns the business too, but that business still pays rent to that individual. 
So there's yeah. a holding company that own that holds all the real estate. Okay. And, and makes, you can and you can amateurize up to 25 years. So that's pretty interesting. On commercial properties, yes, we'll do 25. Yeah. And is that is that 250 and above, or is that? Uh, well, well I mean, you said you went. Yeah, we normally. I haven't had many below 250. We we've looked at some. I know I know Cindy's done some lot smaller than that. Again, if it's needed, uh, our normal commercial real estate deals run five five hundred thousand and above. But uh, we, yeah. we'll, we'll do them smaller if the again if uh, if it meets their mission and it's helping a community that needs something and it's if somebody's willing to go in and and develop this real estate in that area, we're willing to work with them. Yeah, and so now is that for. Uh, purchases and refis or is that purchase only yep, do, um i mean we do purchase refi you will do acquisition and rehab um anything involved with the real estate we do like i said we do a lot of tax credit lending where if it's a building in a historic it's a historical building or it's in a historic district and it's going to qualify from the state or federal tax credits we'll bridge the tax credits so the developer can actually use those tax credits during construction they don't have to wait till the project's complete to get them so that's that really helps. interesting so yeah, i mean do you have, do you have projects. do you have someone on site who's really familiar with the uh, dhr regul regulations through historic tax credits or is that the dhr yeah. partners with you guys we partner with them because they make all those decisions um, yeah. we, we work with we get those deals from consultants around virginia that are historic tax credit consultants and, and they know how to put those deals together and they know we'll not a lot of banks will bridge those tax credits because we actually use the tax credits as our, our collateral for the loan we don't have to be the lender on the construction side but we can do both we've got projects in southwest virginia where we're the construction lender and the bridge the credit uh, bridge lender as well so that's really interesting can you talk more about and i'm sorry i didn't mean to go down this rabbit hole it might be, be a, more of a one-off situation but um so if you hold the tax credits as collateral um i mean so like let's say you're working on a 500 to a million dollar project and then you it's commercial you can carry forward i think it's 25 percent on federal yep. um so i mean so i mean are you saying that you're holding the two hundred fifty thousand dollars in tax credits um as collateral or yep no, we, we actually hold, we do an assignment of the actual tax credits. So the way the historic tax credits normally work, you'll get a very small amount at the beginning when you close the deal. Maybe 10% of the credits will come in. The investor will invest his 10%. Some of them will pay you a little bit at 50%, and then the majority comes in at issuance of a certificate of occupancy. Yeah. We'll bridge 90% of that total that you're going to get and let you use it during construction. And when that investor does that 90% investment at the end, it pays the loan off. So the investor, off. the investor owns those credits and then they use them over the course of five years. That's pretty interesting. That's actually really clever. Yeah. Sandy, you can get you my contact info if you want to talk. So we don't, I know a lot of other people are looking at us like, why are they talking about this? <laughs> well, and yeah, Blake, I was, I was going to even connect you with Cindy Snyder that was here a few weeks ago talking about credit and managing a business. Uh, yeah. One of the things Cindy wanted me to make sure everybody knew is that the SBA now has some really good rates for, uh, let's say that you're renting a building right now and you want to buy that and you're going to occupy at least 51% of that. They've got some great rates right now for uh, uh, business owners who want to get out of that monthly rent or lease and want to uh, uh, buy that building. And I think they can do 85 or 90% loan to value on some of those as well, which is much higher than you get from a bank. Yeah, that's that all sounds pretty interesting. I look forward to connecting. Red Rover, Red Rover, I'll send them right over. Thank you, ma'am. Renee, did you have a question? You're on mute. That's, I'm gonna put that on a t-shirt for Christmas. What, you're on mute or the red? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just, I hope it doesn't seem like a silly question, but I'm just gonna ask it. So you can, are you, are you saying then that you can get low interest loans and, purchase rental property 
and and rent it to low income people is are, is that what you're saying? We have some programs for that, yeah. But it, you've got to be, you would have to work with because well, we partner with VHDA as well, which is the Housing Development Association, and they you, you ha they have to be designated affordable housing. Like there's two different things we treat. Designated means you can't rent it to anyone but low to moderate income families. Right. And then there's some that are just naturally occurring affordable housing. You're just renting a house for seven hundred dollars. It just happened. That's that fits in a low to moderate income. But if somebody came and offered you a thousand, you would take the thousand for it. Right. If it's a designated home, you can't take the thousand for it. Okay. You got to take the 700. We don't have grants that we can match with our loans to do that where you can take the thousand, but if it's on the designated and normally wow. those are going to work, they're not going to be just one house at a time. That's something where it's a 15 or 20 unit apartment complex and oh, all okay. the units and all those units are going to be affordable housing. So we're able to put a, a, a large amount into a community of affordable units at one time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Who else has got questions? Don't let these guys off this easy. I have one more, if, if you don't care. I don't care. Um, do any of the non-traditional lenders um, have revolving products, open-ended lines of credit or anything of that nature for cash flow and operational capital? Nothing Nothing. people incorporated have is op has is open-ended. Um, most of our loans, they, it, you know, if it's for working capital or something like that, we usually, um, from the date of closing, we usually want those fully, those loans fully dispersed within about 90 to, um, about 90 to 120 days, something like that. I was on a call today with Cumberland Plateau Planning District, and they have a revolving loan fund through the EDA. Um, and they have just received $700,000 to be dispersed uh, by June 2022, but it has to, you have to be able to show that you've had a negative impact, but you can use those funds for um, um, working capital, you know, the, and, and the traditional uses, uh, equipment, things like that. So um, again, they, they have a regular revolving loan fund, but those funds are just about depleted from what I understand. But they do have a good amount of money for the um, uh, CARES Act funds. So that might be something if you're looking for some funds you could check into. Low, low interest, very low interest loans. Thanks, Margie. Here revolving lines of credit right now. Uh, we, do, we do revolving lines of credit business use. We put most of those on 12 month terms for review. Uh, they, we do require collateral for those loans, but uh, they're normally priced at something based off of Wall Street Journal Prime, so they would be f fully variable. Uh, okay. The spread from Prime would be primarily based on the strength of the guarantors or the collateral. Thanks, Matt. Next. Come on, Amanda, Donald, Melissa, Bill, you surely you got a question. Deborah, you're too quiet. May I ask one more question? Simon says you may. <laughs> Mr. Repass, um, do, are you all all over the state of Virginia? So I, I so Saltville, are you all, do you all work with investments and non-owner uh, properties and stuff like that in that area? Yeah, we cover far southwestern Virginia um, up to like um, the Roanoke area usually stops right in there. And then we also cover up in the northern Piedmont area up in like Man uh, Manassas and Culpeper and an area up in there okay. too. Yeah. Okay. And, and we can go down, we go as far down into Tennessee. I can do Sullivan County, um, Tennessee. 
Um, and I can go a little bit into West Virginia, like um, into Bluefield and that kind of thing um, over there, too. So, yes, ma'am. Thank Funny you. you should bring up Sobble. That's actually where I live. Oh, wow. I just picked up a house over there. <laughs> um, Wonderful. On West Main Street. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Come on. Questions? For uh, Bill and Amanda, I know you all have been in business for some time. How have you typically been managing like the purchase of inventory and uh, build a, what you've done uh, in opening up your, your business? Most of mine was through uh, just conventional loans through the, through my local bank, national bank for the, uh, for the purchase of the building. Um, most everything else I'm just doing out of pocket on the construction and things like that, that we've done. And my inventory, uh, I'm doing a small part of, my, of the inventory, but my inventory comes from my different vendors. They actually stock the booths and things like that. And then I just take care of selling it for them. Folks, you've got a, a, a good group right here. Oh, sorry. I was making sure he was finished there. Uh, <laughs> but for me, I, so I rent my space here. <clears throat> um, and most of mine has been out of pocket. So when I opened my boutique, I actually started out as consignment. And that was free merchandise to fill my store with. And so I just reinvested the money that I made from that into making it 100% boutique. Um, so... I do have a line of credit because I have to buy in advance. Um, so like I'm already buying for next summer. So I do have a line of credit that I use for that. And then I try to pay it each, uh, each month in whole. Any other input? Oh, I, I will say, Sandy, too, just to kind of give a little insight. Um, I noticed a lot of the financing or a lot of, um, I don't want to call it financing, but uh, the capital, if you will, for the businesses, um, the last two uh, people that spoke come from personal funding. Um, keep in mind, too, not just for because, you know, uh, people incorporate as nonprofit, but just for credit wise, make sure that you don't let your credit lines go too old. Um, before you get to open up a new credit line, um, because any any financial institution that you seek credit from is going to want to see a current um, or a, a recent credit line or, or a credit trade line that you've had at some point in time that you paid well. Um, so if you can get something at a fairly low interest rate, even if it's a very small loan or something like that, it's always good to have one and open and make your payments on time and stuff and not let your credit set too dormant because especially if you're in business for yourself, if, you know, once we get through this whole COVID thing, and I'm sure we will, um, you know, hopefully business is going to start booming again. It's going to start picking back up. So when you want to rebuild that inventory or when you want to expand and so forth like that, if you've let your credit sit dormant for a while, it may be kind of complicated to get the, the credit um, that you, that you may need. So that's just one kind of little thing that I'll throw out there. Um, I know that you both mentioned that you had had small credit lines. Um, but sometimes a, a, a small business can get in a hole because they just didn't need that financing. Um, but if you haven't had financing for a while, it can kind of be hard to get the capital that you need when it, when the time comes that you have to do it. So just a little heads up on that, maybe. Good info. Uh, Ernie, Jeremy, and I don't know, Matt, if you all did any PP, um, P loans or anything, but, uh, you know, I think it would probably be worth sharing with the folks here what held some people back by not having current information or just didn't have the right paperwork. Um, yeah, we, we did a ton of them. I think we ended up doing about 350 of the PPP loans. Uh, 
the, the biggest thing that we saw that, and it, they may have been able to go somewhere else and get it, but we were very adamant that we were going strictly by the rules because we didn't want these loans on the book long term at one percent, and because it was, it's just not beneficial for the bank. But um, that not having a clear and accurate um, account of payroll, because the, the the main thing for the PPP was to to keep people on payroll. Um, we, we, we had some people that applied and had, they sent us their payroll account that said they had this many employees and this is what they were paying. And this is how much it was a quarter. But then when we asked for their quarterly IRS filings and their tax returns, none of the three matched. the, the numbers were all over the place. So, um, so that made us think obviously their other financials probably weren't, <laughs> weren't lined up as well. So I, I can't stress enough keeping up with the payroll, the taxes. Um, I don't think there's a quicker way to lose your business than getting, getting behind on payroll tax or sales tax or whatever it may be to the IRS. But that, that was the main thing we saw, not having a, a real legit, accurate count of when they were there, how long they'd been there and, if you were bringing them back or if you'd already laid them off or things like that. Ernie, we had the, we had the same experience here. Uh, and I think that that really can just dovetail right into small business lending, how it's, it's very important. Uh, and, and you don't necessarily have to have accountant prepared information. Uh, a lot of you guys that are small business owners, I know you have to have your hands uh, in all different aspects of the business, which includes financial reporting. So you are very familiar, but, but accuracy in, in current financial information, uh, at least on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, if your bank can call you and say, say we're, say we're reviewing a line of credit that, that has been kind of evergreen, like Amanda was talking about, she likes to pay it down. Well, if this line of credit, if we review it and we can see that it's going up during a season and then being paid down as the sales come in, uh, if that's not occurring, we may pick up the phone and call and say, hey, can we see your, your, current, pers your current financial information, whether it's an income statement uh, with, with your income and your expenses that you prepared by hand on a ledger paper or it's account prepared. Uh, as long as that information is accurate and we can look at it, we can tie it to historical information and kind of see where you're at. You have a lot better chance of, of getting those line of credits renewed. And obviously, if you're a startup business, you have a lot better chance if you can show, you know, current interim financial information, not necessarily your 2019 tax return, but what you've done monthly in 2020, uh, you, you've got a lot better chance of, of going to a bank and, and putting that information down and saying, hey, this is where I'm at right now and this is where I plan to go. You know, obviously, accountants and, you know, financial planners and things can help with that. But, but I don't always look for the most technical information. I just want to see that you're really hands-on and that you're paying attention to, to your cash collections and your expenses and, and things like that. So, I see a lot of, a lot of new businesses and small businesses. Um, if they're, if they're relatively new, afraid to turn over financials specific, mainly because maybe they're not turning a profit or something when we start off, when you start out, that's not uncommon. I mean, statistically showing, depending upon the type of business you're, you're opening, it takes two to three years to turn a profit in a small business. Um, and, and it's like Matt was saying earlier, and, and Ernie kind of tagged on too. The thing is, is to make sure that you've got your finger on every pulse of your business, to make sure you know what's going on, where your money's going, where you're spending it, where you're going to get it from. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of where the personal guarantee part comes into the financing aspect of the business too, is, um, you know, with this, some, some financial institutions are able to use, um, a global EBITDA, which is where we can combine your personal income into that debt to income factor along with your personal debt too. But, um, if there's a personal guarantee there, then that says, Hey, if, if, if the business doesn't make the money that it's needed to pay back this loan, or if I need a little help, then I'm giving my personal guarantee, my personal income to do that. So, you know, like Ernie and Matt was talking about making sure that you, you know, you're handing over accurate, you know, good uh, statistical financial projections and so forth. 
Um, make sure they're, I always tell people, you know, in, if you're doing some type of predict, projection, um, you're better off lowballing it and letting your banker know that you lowball your projections rather than over forecast because th those over forecasts can stick out like a sore thumb. Um, you know, if you're, you're expecting to make an astronomical amount of money and it just can't happen in the community that you live, it's going to stick out. So, um, and I think it's especially important now coming out of 2020 with all the, the small businesses has had, uh, that, uh, that we've had to take on um, with businesses shutting down and stuff, just make sure you're as accurate as possible um, and forthcoming with the information. It'll, it, I think it goes a very long way. I don't want to do a, a sales pitch for accountants or, or bookkeeping professionals, but most of you guys get into small business. Your business is not preparing financial information. So are you actually costing yourself uh, sales and growth by spending your time putting this financial information together. As we've shown, if you want to borrow money, if, if you want to be well capitalized, it's very important. But at the same time, is your time better off being spent on your business uh, and maybe finding someone else uh, to, to maybe prepare your financials and keep up with those items? I'm not saying it's required, but you always got to do that cost benefit analysis when you're looking at, at preparing internal financials. Great point, Matt. And um, I know that Arnie and Jeremy know, but part of this business challenge is they have to pitch their business idea. Like if they come and sit down in front of you, uh, tell you about their business. And also they have to submit a business plan. Could each of you all share why that is so important is to have that nailed down? Can, can I say something first? You certainly can. On the flip side, from the Small Business Development Center's perspective, we encourage the business owners to know their numbers and to know, you know, what those, what those revenue projections are, what their cost of goods, what their expenses are, uh, because we've seen in the past that uh, they would come to us, they asked for help with the business plan, the business plan is done by the Small Business Development Center, and then they go to the bank, and the banker asks them questions, and they don't know what you know what the answer is they, because they don't know uh, their numbers, they don't know um, any of that kind of information. So, uh, I, I agree that uh, it is very time consuming, but I think it's also important that they sit down with their CPA or with whomever uh, they're working with to do those projections, so that they will know what those numbers are. That's a very good point, Margie. I've actually, anytime I recommend somebody, if they come to me and they don't have their business plan or their financial projections together, um, I tell them both, you need, you, first of all, it's worth the money you're going to pay for a good CPA. You'll save that money in the long run, if nothing else in taxes um, that they can help you out with. And then number two, uh, you shouldn't go into a, a you shouldn't go to a, a, a business development center with a blank sheet of paper. You should know what you're going to be doing, where you wanna get your projections from, your statistics. They have tools, and, and Margie, correct me if I'm wrong, but the S SBDCs have tools that can help you come up with these projections. But, you know, would you, would you treat your personal finances that way? Would you take off on a vacation or on a trip, not knowing how much it's gonna cost and just hoping that the money you have in the bank is gonna be enough, so. Um, I, 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 to mirror back on what Matt said, um, a CPA is well worth the money spent, a good one, and uh, the SBDCs are there for your help, but make sure you go in with loaded guns and they'll help you pull the trigger on it. Yeah, that, and, and we've, uh, AirBank, I've sent in on our small business loan reviews, we've went as, as far as to require an accountant. If, if you've been in business for two or three years and we look at your financials and there's some gaps and some holes. One of our loan conditions is if you don't hire an accounting firm, we, we're not gonna make the loan. So that's how important the numbers are. And just kind of adding to that and kind of uh, answering or, or giving an answer to Sandy's question, basically all this information needs to be put together and, and like, uh, like Margie said, understood by the bar because it goes back to we really are building a relationship. We have a vested interest in seeing you succeed. So you're not necessarily selling it to us, but there's going to be a lot of questions and a lot of understanding that
that we're going to go through before we extend extend money because we want to see you succeed. We obviously don't want to we don't want the collateral back. You know, we don't we don't want to see you fail. So we're actually a partner in this. So we want your under we want you to represent your understanding of your business to us so that so that we can be on the same page and we can move forward with you. Pam, in your experience in working with the businesses in Tazewell County, anything you want to add on to what uh, these professionals have, have shared this evening? Well, I, I disagree with Margie about the, the business plan and having their uh, forecast performance for the next couple of years because most of the uh, lending agencies are going to require them to have that information when they go to borrow money. and. Uh, it's just so important for them to have the business plan and uh, to kind of know what what they're going to need, what the future, at least have an idea of what, what they're going to need and moving forward with the business. And, and that applies to startups. You definitely have to have that as a startup, but that also applies to any type of business expansion or growth that you're looking to finance. Uh, what, right. what, what is that growth going to do in the future? Well, that's even true with uh, our experience with expansions. Uh, most of the time, if they don't have a current business plan, they they are required by the lender to go get, if they have a business plan, they have they need, need to get it updated. If they don't have one, they're going to have to get one for an expansion as well. I think the gist is these lenders and, and organizations want to lend out money, but they also don't want to put you in a gap to where you obviously have not done your research and you're not going to be able to, you're not looked at all aspects and you may not be able to, to make those payments. And, you know, you got to have those payments done or the guy in the, with the baseball bat and the Cadillac comes up and looks for you. Um, I mean, there's money out there if for bankable deals, but you also have to be prepared before you go seeking that. Another hey, thing I, too, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Another thing too is we've all been through the PPP loans. We've all been through the auto loans. We've all been through the Rebuild Virginia. The one thing that they require is good current financials. When that money comes up and it's a grant and they say it's there until it runs out, if you don't do not have your financials together, you're not ready to apply. Everyone that had their financials and are well organized and had that business plan and knew where their business was financially was able to apply because all they had to do is go to their CPA or pull their financials out and submit them. So I mean, we the one thing we've learned through COVID is you have to be prepared. And if you're prepared in your business, one, you're going to be on good financial footing because you're going to understand where you're at. Even if you do need a little help, there's no there, with COVID, there's, there's no shame in that. We've all had to go through that. But those people that were prepared with their financials in grid order, then they were able to go and get those funds in advance up front. And we're even seeing with the Rebuild Virginia, even at, when they stopped at $10,000, because people submitted good financials, they raised the limit to 100,000, they went back and automatically reviewed that and sending people additional checks. So if you are well prepared, then when, when catastrophe happens or pandemics happen, then you're just ready to move and any help that that's, that's put out there available to you. So can you guys expand on the uh, Rebuild Virginia grant really quick? Because um, did they remove the qualifications of, you know, if you got any EIDL financing or uh, not financing, but grant money or CARES Act grant money that they were no, like not issuing those grants to those people or? They have removed that, that guideline. No, they removed that guideline. If you got CARES Act money, you can apply. You cannot apply for them to cover uh, PPE um, to cover that if that has already been taken care of by the CARES Act money. You can't double dip uh, for the PPP expenses, but um, but you can apply even if you've got PP, uh, the PPP, um, the idle loan, anything of that nature. Okay, that's interesting. That was recently, uh, Blake, I think in the last two weeks, maybe three weeks at the top, so you're not that far behind the news. Yeah, well, and so what I saw, I read the other day that they raised the limit to 100000 So what does that cover? 
basically the same thing uh, that you know the utilities, rent, mortgage, uh, payroll. But again, you can't double dip. So if you've yeah. already you've already asked for you know funds for previously through another uh, CARES Act program, then you can't ask for it again. But if it's new expenses, you can. Other than other than what Misty just said, the PPE. And they're figuring those based on three months expenses. So they will pay up to three months expenses up to $100,000. Okay, gotcha. Okay, do we have any other questions? Going once. Oh. I've got a question for Ernie. You hit on a little bit about um, owning the property with one LLC and kind of leasing it or renting it out to another one. Uh, is there anything you can expand on that as a as a banker, not as a lawyer or a CPA? But can you talk a little bit about some of the ins and outs of that, or maybe a maybe a contract between the two parties or something like that? Um, it, it's definitely something that there's got to be a benefit because a lot of people do. <laughs> And I'm not an accountant. Our other banker is an accountant. He might be able to help us out. But uh, we, we see it where some will do an, uh, an LLC just for each project. So each building they're going to be developing. Or some will have a, they'll have their development company that does all the work here as an LLC. And then they'll have another LLC set up that'll hold all the real estate. So it'll own all the real estate and all the rents and leases and everything go through that entity. Um, so we would make the loan to the entity that actually holds the real estate. It still, either way, the, whoever the individual is that owns the LLC still has to guarantee the loan. But I know it does take some of the liability off of the, the original business if it's separate. And there, there's got to be a tax benefit of when you're paying the rent or writing it down out of your, your operating business. But what that exact benefit is and how much it is, I've got no clue to what that would be. Ernie, you're, you're right there. Uh, an LLC is limited liability, and that's basically what it boils down to. These guys set up these various LLCs to, to remove remove the liability from, uh, you know, themselves personally as owners or from their primary operating business. A lot of times if the real estate is owned in an LLC and that LLC only owns the real estate if they're sued, then the only thing they can lose is the real estate. Obviously, I'm not an attorney. That's just kind of <laughs> A base of what happened. You're also right. There is uh, various tax benefits uh, depending on how rent is paid, as opposed to you know that that can definitely get you around uh, different payroll taxes and things like that, as opposed to salary. So there, there are several things on the tax, and but but mostly it's for the liability coverage. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Going once. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, Renee. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, so I currently have a home business. I do um, okay, and so there are things that I would like to do um, to with my business. Is it possible to put in for a loan? Because, you know, people, when you do business out of your home, you know, they look at it a lot different. Um, is it possible to put in for a business loan using my home as collateral? You know what I'm saying? Um, to do the expansions, to do the things that I would like to do. So pretty much what, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, you're wanting to do a business loan for your business, but you're wanting to use your personal assets to secure the loan with pretty much. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't answer for anybody else, but okay. yeah, I mean, it, the, the collateral that, that we have to have in people incorporated doesn't necessarily have to be owned by the business. I've got, I've got individuals that own a business, but don't have any assets, tangible assets within the business. Okay. Um, other than maybe like an accounts receivable kind of thing, which which we can't use. Um, mm -hmm. 
it has to be tangible assets that we use, but they use their own personal vehicles or like you were saying, they may use their own personal real estate that they may own. And and the answer for people incorporated is yes, ma'am, we can do that. I'm glad I asked. Okay. Thank you. No no such Uh, thing as a dumb question. (laughs) The the one thing that I would question on that is Renee, you mentioned that you wanted to do an expansion to the house. I, I, I think they're really going to dive in and see what you're doing. Obviously, if it's a business loan, it's there can't be anything that's going to improve the personal part of the residence. I don't think. I, I don't. Th- we would look at it that way. Now, if you were adding a section on a uh, twenty by twenty section, and that was going to be your office, probably so. But if it was, it would just be dependent on what you're doing and that what that work is. Yeah. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Ernie. I missed that part. Yeah. I, and I'll I'll agree with Ernie. Um, in that if the if the expansion to your home, if, if the money being used is going to be an expansion to your home or anything like that, then it has to be justifiable to be beneficial to the business in some fashion. Thank, thank you, Ernie, for pointing that out. What I'm here for, hey. hey, it's Blake again, and I promise this is my last question. But this is a question for um, really Lori and uh, Pam. Do you guys know, has there been an impact study done for Tazewell County as far as the need for lodging um, that we could get access to? Because there's a couple of these, there's a couple, there's a couple of these programs that seem very interesting and very uh, competitive with traditional financing that um, could stem into another project. Lori, did you say you want me to take that? Blake, uh, there's always studies being done, especially where the the government's involved. We're always doing studies, but uh, I think they did recently do a study on the need for lodging. Uh, I could possibly get that for you. Yeah, I would be interested to see what the numbers actually look like. Okay. Yeah, I would love to see that as well. All if, right. I would love those numbers. Thank you. I know the uh, VHDA just completed a housing study for Tazewell County. Yeah. As I'm working on another project and they're using that housing study. I'd like to see that as well, Pam. Okay. Um, I think uh, the town of Tazewell and also the town of Bluefield did independent studies as well, didn't they? They did. Okay. Yeah. And I know, I know the town of Richlands actually just went through that um, I think it might be involved with the VD, uh, VHDA as well. It um, is. For, yeah, that's the same project that I'm probably uh, thinking about that they have the information to. So. I'll send you what I can put my hands on, okay? Okay, thank you. Well, make, make sure you kill the germs before you send it to him. I'll spit on it. If you're putting your hands on it. <laughs> It won't matter if it's electronically, right? That's right. Yeah, right. I'll tell you. I was happy to get back to Harrisonburg on uh, Monday. I feel a lot safer up here from COVID. <laughs> even though. <laughs> Donald, Melissa, uh, Debbie, do you have any questions? Y'all been quiet. I just want to make sure that everything is answered for you that, that you may have when it comes to financing. I'll ask Margie a question if that's okay. I'm, you can ask all the questions except the winning lottery numbers and she won't share that. On the uh, Cumberland Plateau, uh, you said that they had more funds available, but it is a loan, is that correct? It is a low interest loan. Uh, and it is one that um, I think that they can pretty much establish based on the need uh, you know, for the area. Um, I think the maximum amount is 250000 and they did have some criteria that you had to meet relative to like job creation. But I think this COVID program, they've waived a lot of those things. Like, you know, you used to have two letters of uh, from a bank saying you couldn't get a loan and things like that, but they've waived all of that for, uh, for this COVID. And uh, I think the funds will be available through June 2022, if I'm not mistaken. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Well, Ernie, Jeremy, Matt, thanks so very much for spending your Thursday evening with us. I know this, thank you. this is kicked into the Andy Griffith time of the evening, but I appreciate you sharing it with us and sharing your knowledge. And um, I'll be happy to send uh, everyone the contact information for each of these uh, gurus and that you can have uh, in your arsenal when, it, when the time comes. So, um, well, thank you guys and uh, good luck. Thank you. So uh, if the challengers will stay on, uh, we've got some housekeeping things to discuss quickly. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. Good to see you. You too. Stay and safe. Thanks, thanks, Matt, if you've not already left. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Okay. I, I know you love to get out early, so I'm going to be short and sweet. First of all, uh, next week is pitch night. I wanted to talk a little bit about pitch night for everyone. If you recall, on the first session, I shared that each contestant will have eight minutes to pitch your business idea. How you do that is totally up to you. If you want to do, excuse me, a, a, a PowerPoint, if you want to do a video, if you just want to be sitting there and smile on your face, talking about your business, that's totally up to you, but you have eight minutes. That is your time to put your best foot forward and tell folks, uh, tell the judges uh, what your business is all about. Uh, so that's, that's very, very important. Um, and at one minute, either Pam or myself or someone will let you know when it's the one minute warning so that you can start wrapping it up. And then after you've done your pitch, we will allow up to five minutes for the judges to ask you questions. Um, there's times where you might have missed a part or the judges are intrigued and they want to learn more. Maybe you know, uh, tell me more about what your marketing plans are, or uh, maybe you failed to share what, if you were to win, what you're going to do with the winning money. It's, uh, who knows how it's going to happen. So we'll allow five minutes uh, on that. So, um, so we'll have the five minutes Q&A. So uh, anybody having questions on that part? It will be very interesting doing it on uh, virtually. Who was that, Blake? Yeah, so is the five minutes in addition to the eight minutes for the yes. Q&A? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, any questions on that? And, and if you are doing a PowerPoint, I will say that if you don't feel comfortable sharing your own slides, you could send those to me um, and I will share those on the screen with you. But now, as you can see, uh, probably on the bottom of your screen, the little green, lime green that says share screen. You should be able, if you do have slides or you want to show a video, you should have the ability to uh, handle everything yourself there. But you do have backup if you need it. Questions? Cindy? Yes, ma'am. Uh, are we going to decide tonight who goes first? On yes, but before I do that, I want to know if every one of you all are planning on pitching your business idea that's still with us. I show seven still uh, on the call. So is everybody, you can do a thumbs up or what have you, is everyone going to pitch their business idea? Renee? Okay. The reason I ask is I still have only received four signed and initialized guidelines. That is a prerequisite. Before you can pitch your business idea, we need those. I was hoping I could get those tonight, but if you can get those to me by the first of the week, um, I've got Blake's, Renee's, Donald's, and um, Bill's, and those are the only ones that I have so far. We need those. That way, if there's any questions, should you be the big winner driving up in your limo or what have you, uh, we want to make sure, and if there's any questions, we want to make sure that you are aware of all the guidelines and what's required of you going forward. 
Now, since you said that you are going to pitch your business idea and on good faith that you are going to send that guides, sign guides to Pam, Margie, or myself over the next few days, um, we can't meet in person and take numbers. So I'm going to leave it up to who would like to go first and you all pick in what order you'd like to do it. This is really, really getting quiet. I hear the crickets. I'll go first. Good job, Deborah. Okay. Second. Is that you, Renee? Okay. Three. I'll go third. And I think I sent my disclosures over right before this. Okay, then I, I, I didn't see it, but I'll get it. Number four. I'll take Blake. four. Who was that, Donald or Blake? Does it matter? Okay. Donald, I put you down four. So Blake, you want me to put you Perfect. five? I saw you. You're mute. You're muted. That's going to be my new T-shirt. I'm happy to go whenever. It doesn't matter to me. So. Okay. I'll put you on five. So Bill, that leaves you number six. Okay. Okay. Who am I missing? Melissa. Oh yeah, Melissa. What would you like to do? I'm sorry. You're on mute. It doesn't matter to me. Oh, would you and Bill like to fight it out? <laughs> I'm not going to fight it out for it. So, <laughs> Tell me, which one would rather be fifth or be uh, sixth? Or which one would like to be last? You, Y'all just say, speak. I honestly don't care. Okay. Six, Melissa, and seven, Bill. That's fine with me. What I will do is I will start um, uh, the Zoom meeting next week at 530. So if anybody wants to come on early, let me know. Or sometime in the week, next week that you want to test it, I could do a test Zoom. And just between you and I, if you want to test uh, sharing your screen, that's fine. Again, if you don't feel comfortable, if you're doing a PowerPoint and you want to share those with me, uh, please do so to give me time. I would rather have them at least a day before. I would love to have them by Wednesday so that I can load them all onto my computer and have them ready to go. That would help when, a lot. When are our um, business plans due to you to have review? Excellent. I need those electronically by the 24th of November, or as my niece used to say, no remember. That would be next Wednesday, right before you get ready to carve into the turkey. And then we will have about a week to a week and a half for the judges to review. Uh, and we do all the total scores. And Pam and I have not discussed yet how we're going to announce those, but we will. And we will let you know um, uh, when that how the how the county wants to do the announcement of the awards. But next on the twenty fourth, right before Thanksgiving, before you you start uh, prepping that bird, uh, be sure you get your business plan done. And again, to help, uh, we don't want any paper, so keep that uh, do it electronically. Does anybody have any problems with that? Well, Sandy, I was going to. I was going to say, since our COVID numbers, I was thinking they might could attend the IDA meeting, but it just depends on how our COVID numbers are going at that time. Our next IDA meeting, um, we had, we would probably meet December the 9th at four o'clock. We could do it that afternoon, that evening around five or so if they wanted to. I mean, if if everyone is okay with doing it in person, if not, you may want to just do it virtually again. So we'll yeah, I, have to I'm, just wait that I, I will let you make that decision, Pam. That's the only decision I will allow you to make. But, um, but yeah. <laughs> Bill, did you're, you have a question? 
Yeah, I, I was going to see if you were going to outlaw some of those uh, contraband bribes like we had last year with the food and the CBD things. You know, I I don't want Blake coming in there with a bunch of beer samples or something to uh, well, get over on the rest of it. So. Unless he's really good and could have the smell of vision through Zoom, I don't believe that he will be able to do that this year. Yeah, and luck, lucky for you, the ABC does not allow beer samples, so we can't do that. <laughs> hey, we had CPD last year. <laughs> we did. I don't know who governs that stuff. And some pretty good food, too. Yeah, we did. Yeah, unfortunately, we won't be doing that this year. That's the one of the things that I miss having it in person was the – discussions before and after each session and building those relationships. And then of course the uh, free uh, samples of uh, food and, and uh, I don't remember the CBD, but I guess I was running cameras and didn't, uh, I didn't get in that good, but. Uh, you didn't partake of that. Huh? No, no. I had, like it, five, I, I had like five of those CBD gummies last year and I slept <laughs> like a baby. <laughs> hey, I need some of them so I could sleep. Um, any questions, anything? No, I do have a comment. Um, I did see on the chamber website today that, uh, Susan Jewell, who participated last year has officially opened, uh, her business. So that's pretty cool. That's correct. Yeah. I think they just had the grand opening. Was that today? At that was tonight. Five? This evening at five. Yeah. I thought it was tonight. Well, great for her. What was the business? What is the business? Um, um, it's health lifestyle coaching. I've got the shoes here somewhere. So if you're struggling with um, health issues, she she kind of helps you develop a regiment of, you know, protein diet, but also exercise and the whole thing. And, and it's kind of like your, your personal coach to help you through that, especially if you've had... I think it's vital health and wellness coaching, I believe. Something what like she that. said. Yeah. Margie, you're quiet. Anything you want to add, my friend? I have nothing. It's been a long day. Oh, man. You sound like a, a song. I have nothing. Maybe that Andy <laughs> Williams or somebody sung. But thanks, everybody. Uh, uh, I can't, again, I can't believe that five weeks have already gone past and I know you all can't wait to stop getting uh, emails from me but again if you are going to do a PowerPoint get those to me by next Wednesday if you want to test it I will start the zoom meeting at 5 30 and you can test it then or if you don't want everybody else seeing it uh, just if you want to do something private as a test um, send me a note and we'll try to work out schedules and we will do that on your time but uh, this is important it's very important to your score uh, as well as your business plan. And I hope that you've been working with Margie and her team and getting that business plan finalized. Uh, seems like the last two weeks, that's all I've done. Um, for those that didn't get on the call early, I just finished up the Floyd C4 challenge. And we it was the biggest group uh, to date on that one. And they had 10 folks on um, that competed and I was on a zoom meeting for nine hours at Monday and it should be against the law to do that on a Monday for nine hours but they uh, they gave out nine eleven thousand eight hundred and ninety two uh, folks and um, I was my first ever circus business plan and business pitch I ever heard and reviewed so I have I have done it all so far okay any other questions do y'all want to uh we well, still get an andy griffith in hey, Sandy. yes one thing that you did offer uh i think you've offered it several times is if they want to do a try you know like a dry run or something with their cell with their pitch they could either give it to you or margie or me one they could call us up and we can let them try it out on us. As I say, if you want to do that, and I could check with Margie and, and uh, Pam if you decide when you what time and if they're available, they're welcome to join. I'm happy to give you any feedback. Um, 
please don't read it off. That's one thing that uh, I will highly recommend. Uh, and be sure you get the major points is let them know, just kind of like the points of your business plan is what is it you're going to be doing? What's the need in the market? How are you going to promote your business? How are you going to finance it? And if you should win the money, what you're going to be doing with it? I mean, most of those major things that's in your business plan, except you only have eight minutes to do it in. Okay. Okay. That's all, folks, for the evening. Enjoy. Take care. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.